Good evening, everybody. This is our uh, second virtual Isla Ferry Project webinar. Um, I think we all know um, that in normal circumstances we would be on the island, um, but given the current circumstances, we're unable to do so. Um, so I'd like to welcome everybody. I think we've got about 70 people signed up, but there may be more joining, so that will be good. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, please. So the webinar will last approximately two hours. Um, within that, there will be the presentation. The people that are presenting tonight um, will be um, Jim Anderson um, doing the technical details along with Lewis Hamill, um, myself doing some of the port stuff and some of the passenger um, details and also Mark Hoskins from Transport Scotland. As you know, we have a dedicated project page and the, uh, the email address is there and we will be sending this live on the website and on the CMO uh, YouTube channel uh, tomorrow morning when we get a chance to upload it. The Q&A session will be conducted by Brian Fulton, um, who's head of business support in CMO. He joined us in January. Uh, last time round I did it, but because I'm presenting this time, there might be some questions I have to ask and don't want to be asking questions to myself. So Brian has volunteered to do it with an arm up his back. Um, we have a chat box at the right hand side of Teams. Um, it's optional whether you use your name or post an anonymously. Um, and we will do our best to get through all the Q and A's, um, whether they're anonymous or whether it's named, we can see them. Um, but as we did last time, anything that can't be answered or is too complicated to answer um, tonight, we will uh, loop back round and we will make sure that we answer it in the Q and A document, which will be posted up. Um, after the session, if you have any further questions, you can also email us and the website is the Isla Vessel at cmassets.co.uk. So in advance, I'd like to thank you for your, um, your time. I'd like us to thank you for your questions in advance and I'll hand over to Jim, who's going to get on with the main body of the presentation tonight. And uh, I'll be I'll be speaking later and, and hopefully we'll be answering some questions as well. Thank you very much. Jim, sorry, you're on mute, Jim. Sorry, you're on mute. Oops, sorry about that. I'm back. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Anderson, as Kevin's introduced, Director of Vessels at CMAL. Uh, we're going to do start off this presentation with a recap of the January webinar uh, that we held just after the new year there. Some of the items that we covered in the January webinar were vessel requirements. We covered the vessel, vessel feasibility studies and comparison of vessel options. We looked at main particulars. We looked at uh, emissions and fuel consumption analysis. We gave some details of cargo carrying capacity of vehicle deck configurations, passenger capacities and facilities, accessibility. We covered crew levels. Uh, we covered a comparison of a catamaran versus a mono hull. We covered port enabling works future port developments. We covered the dynamic mooring analysis studies that we carried out. Uh, we looked at forecast demand and freight service, and we also gave a, an indication of the potential planning dates for the project. So from the, the January webinar, 171 people signed up for the webinar with a peak attendance of 97 attendees at the event so it was it was well received we we in turn received over 150 questions during and after the webinar and some of those 150 questions each had sub questions uh, we currently have 168 queues at q a's on the latest q a document and you can find all the responses to all the questions and all the queries can be found at our website, the project specific website at www.cmassets.co forward slash project forward slash Isla. And if you look here at the breakdown of the Q&A in this lovely, nice pie chart, colourful pie chart, uh, we had a good mix of questions here. 4% of the questions were questions that were asked around crewing. 
8% were general feedback on the webinar itself and, and communications and how we do that. 8% were on roles, responsibilities, policy, network and timetables. 7% was about the procurement and the project timelines. 16% was regarding passengers and accessibility. 7% was looking at freight capacities and forecast demand. 13% port infrastructure and enabling works. And over a third actually were more on what you would consider to be the more technical aspects of the ship, which was quite interesting. You know that we had 37% of the questions were more on vessel design and vessel options. So just to refresh the options that were presented in the January webinar, option one was to look at replacing the MV Hebridean hours with a new vessel of the same size and speed as Finlagen, which already operates on the Isla route, and that's an 89.8 .8 metre vessel. Option two was to replace the MV Hebridean Isles with a new vessel, which is at 94.8 metres with greater vehicle capacity than option one vessel. And option three was to look at replacing the MV Hebridean Isles with two new vessels in the order of 70 to 75 metres with the same combined vehicle capacity as option two. And other options that were, were looked at, but they were not carried forward for detailed analysis, was to replace the MV Hebridean Isles with a new vessel, which was over 100 metres, with again greater vehicle capacity than option two. Other options, which will still be considered at a future point, are to replace the MV Hebridean Isles and the Finlagen with two new option two vessels. So that's a refresh of the, of the options that were presented in, in January. Here's a refresh, and I won't go through every detail here because we've only got two hours, but here's a refresh of the actual main particulars of the vessel, of the displacement, of the dead weight, the cargo dead weight, the speed, passenger capacity, cars, numbers of HGVs, crew cabins and training cabins. So where are, where are we now? The, the detailed analysis that we've carried out has established that the vessel option two has several significant benefits compared to options one and three, as well as the existing vessels currently serving the route. And the option two is the emerging preferred option for the route. However, for option two and its corresponding benefit benefits to be realised, port enabling works are required. The analysis carried out shows that the benefits of option two outweigh the costs of the port enabling works. So tonight's webinar. Tonight, we will provide further details on the following. We're going to give an update on the status of the project. We're also going to give an update on the estimated vessel costs for the options. We're going to talk about some of the vessel design aspects. We're going to talk about optimised hull forum. We're going to speak about propulsion concept, propulsor types, station holding and windage, vehicle deck configurations, vessel and port interfaces, crew levels, passenger spaces, facilities and retail offering, accessibility, passenger capacity, port enabling works, including the estimated costs of the port enabling works. We're going to touch on the shore power, We're going to speak about marshalling areas, We're going to speak about the freight service and forecast demand, and also talk about the planning date. So we've got a lot to go through. So I'll probably try and hurry up through a lot of these slides as we go along because we've got 46 slides to go through and we're now on slide number 11. Current status of the project, as I previously stated on that previous slide here, option two vessel is the preferred vessel option and we're very, very close to completing all the feasibility studies for the option two vessels. Uh, one piece of work which is still going on at the moment, uh, I don't know who, if you're too aware of this, but at the moment, we've got an acoustic Doppler current profiler, also known as an ADCP. That's been deployed at Port Askeg since the 5th of January, and that's been put in place to actually measure the current velocities at the berth. The planned date of recovery uh, for the ADCP is either the 5th, which is the Easter Monday, if I'm right, uh, or the 6th of April. And the data from the device will be gathered and analysed to provide an accurate assessment of the mooring forces to inform the mooring solution for the, obviously for the vessel, which is uh, five metres longer than the existing vessel Finlagen. 
Where we're at now with the project is we are now going to move to stage one of procurement for the vessel, and that's the call for competition. So we're calling that tender stage one. And what tender stage one is, is a selection questionnaire. It's known as the single procurement document Scotland. And what that will do, it will identify suitable bidders that have the required technical capabilities and capacities and economic and financial standing to design, build, manage and deliver the vessel. And what it will also do, it will eliminate at this first stage of procurement, it will eliminate from the procurement those who do not have the required technical capabilities and economic and financial standing to deliver the vessel. So one of the many questions that we received during the Q&A actually was to for us to come back and present uh, the actual estimated costs for the new vessels. So here they are. For the option one vessel, which is a vessel of similar size to existing vessel Finlagen, the capital cost costs, the budget estimated capital costs of acquiring the new vessel are 48 million for that vessel. There's also an allowance for variations in the contract of 1.44 million. For the option two vessel, the capital costs are estimated at around 50 million for that vessel with a corresponding uh, 1.5 million allowance for variations. The capital costs of the two smaller vessel option, the total sum value for that is 56 million and an allowance there of 1.68 million. So that's the that's the, the budget capital cost, estimated capital cost for the three options. When we start to look at the vessel operating costs, when we look at option one, the fuel costs for vessel option one, the estimated fuel costs for option one are £62 million pounds over 30 years. Other operating costs, crewing costs, um, harbour dues, etc., estimated over the 30 years for the option one are 188 million, which gives a total operating cost over 30 years of 250 million. If we compare that with option two, you can see that the fuel costs with the optimised hull design are much reduced from that of option one, 39 million compared to 62 million. The operating costs of the new vessels are slightly higher than the, the existing vessel at 191, but when we take the overall total operating costs, we have 230 million compared to 250 million. Looking at the option three vessels, 54 million for the fuel costs over the 30 years and 326 million to actually operate two vessels over the 30 years giving a combined total operating cost of 380 million for the option three vessel over the 30 years. The operating costs, there are some assumptions in here. The operating costs do not include the charter fee for, for the new vessel, for the investment cost of the new vessel. Uh, it's the, the costs are based on the operating MV Finlagen current timetable. We're assuming a reduction in fuel of 34% and that's been based upon the, the CFD work that's been carried, carried out for the new vessel. Uh, it's considering a mariner's retail offering with limited operating hours. And in addition, with the new vessel, with the increased capacity, an assessment has been made of the new vessel forecasted revenue with the increased capacity. And the estimates of that are 21 million from 2024 to 2035. And again, that's based upon the following assumptions that the demand will recover to pre-COVID COVID levels on increased shoreside marshalling capacity and the vehicle deck capacity can be fully utilised. Option two, now I'm going to cover some of the vessel design aspects of option two. As presented at the webinar in January, the option two vessel hull form provides several benefits, which includes an optimised hull form, low, lower emissions and lower carbon footprint, lower fuel consumption, lower fuel cons uh, costs, lower energy usage, also increased vehicle deck space for the option two vessel, 
There will be improved sea keeping, which improves passenger and crew comfort, reduced drift due to the deeper draft, and improved propulsion effectiveness due to the deeper draft. And the hull form and the hull resistant for option two has been developed and verified by experts in the field of hydrodynamics. That's some of the questions that actually came out of the Q&A when we presented the, the figures, which are obviously quite interesting figures that were presented. But this, this work has all been done by experts in the field and the work has been carried out by the companies Navalu and HSVA, who are, who are a centre of excellence in this type of work. And the table over to the right gives some of the details on, on the vessel that we touched on on the previous webinar. Propulsion, we were asked many questions about the propulsion type for the, for the new vessel. The feasibility studies covered a number of options for propulsors, which included controllable pitch propellers, CPP, and that also included azimuth propulsors. Following our very, very detailed analysis, an azimuth propulsor type has been selected for the, for the new vessel, for the specification for the new vessel. The main advantages of using azimuth propulsors over conventional propeller types are that we'll have increased manoeuvrability for the new vessel, increased reverse thrust for the new vessel, but in addition, we'll ha have lower propulsion power in order to, to achieve that required full reverse thrust. And we'll also have a lower response time from full ahead to full astern. So lots of benefits there of going down the the azimuth and propulsor route. The propulsion concept that we will be specifying as part of the, the tender technical specification uh, with the shipyards is for a, a hybrid lithium iron battery diesel electric propulsion system with, as we spoke about earlier, the azimuth and propulsors. Over to the right here is a very, very simplified um, single line diagram. And please note it is very simplified for, for any, any experts out there, because we know we're not showing any of the bus coupler arrangements or circuit breakers and the various mode of operations that you would expect for a diesel electric system. But that, that's showing the basis of the system. Uh, what we will be specifying for this new ship is that the, the propulsors will be two times 2,200 kilowatt azimuth and propulsors, which is greatly reduced from some of the similar vessels in the class. We are looking at four times 1,530 kilowatt medium speed uh, diesel generators. We will be having two times, 800 and kilo, two times 880 kilowatts transverse bow thrusters. Short power, we'll be looking at two times 800 to approximately 1,000 short supply connections. The motors we will be specifying for the propulsion and also the, the, the smaller motors in the ship will be premium efficiency type propulsion motors. And the lithium iron battery banks, which we'll be using for peak shaving, for import operation, also be able to use them in manoeuvring for certain conditions also perhaps for slow speed operation, we're looking at two times 530 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery banks. Uh, and I see we've got the transverse thrusters in twice. We did look at LNG for a few, as you, you'll be aware out there, 801 and 802 are dual fuel LNG uh, diesel vessels. But uh, given the low power requirements of the option to hull, and the range of available engines, uh, um, LNG wasn't an option for, for this vessel or, or an option that was actually needed. Lots of questions we've had about station keeping and windage for the new vessel compared to existing vessels. The option two will have an approximately 6% increase in windage compared with uh, MV Finlagen. This is largely due to the requirements for the, the increased garage height of 5.1 metres below the stored mezzanine deck. So we'll basically increase the garage height to get you know, a range of vehicles on, on the vehicle deck, below the, the stored mez deck, above the mez deck. So that's increased the actual height by 500 millimetres compared to other vessels. The, the small diagram here below shows a comparison study that we had carried out looking at the station keeping capabilities of the option two vessel uh, compared with the, the Finlagen. And as you can see here, the option two vessel 
station keeping can hold station with a maximum wind speed on the beam of 43.7 knots, whereas existing vessel Finlagen, uh, that that limit is actually 36 knots. So you can see that there's a, there's a quite a significant increase in the actual station holding capability of the new vessel. And the table that we have over on the right here is giving the comparison of the windage, but also giving you a comparison of the actual installed propulsion power, whereby on Finlagen we have two times 4,000 kilowatts propulsion power, and on the new vessel we're looking at two times 2,200. So it's almost half the propulsion power. Uh, and as you can see, the bow thrusters are two times 880 kilowatts compared to 200, two times 600 kilowatts. So that's just a bit of background on the, the, the more technical aspects of the ship, what we're looking at doing with regard to propulsion system, propulsors, and uh, a comparison of the station holding and windage. So with that, I am now going to hand over to, to Lewis. Thank you, Jim. All right, so um, moving on to the vehicle deck. So as we've we done back in the January webinar, we kind of showed you some high level layouts um, of the three different options. Now we're kind of focusing more on option two in particular. On the right hand side here, you can see the diagrams that we showed the last time, um, really depicting the space that's filled, particularly for the HGVs, showing space for 14, albeit these wouldn't be fully laden, um, but it's just more focusing on the space. So. Focusing on option two, as we've kind of said before, we would have a dead weight of 750 tonnes, providing a cargo dead weight of, a, of approximately 476 tonnes. That provides an HGV capacity if we were to carry 14 of around 34 tonnes or space for 10 44 tonnes. Um, but it would also give space for 24 cars. Comparing that to Finlagen, there is space for, for 10 44 tonne HGVs, but you wouldn't be able to carry any additional cars. Four cars on the main deck and the mezzanine decks, as we touched on the last time, it is very much dependent on the size of vehicles. So the numbers will kind of vary in practice compared to what's shown on a drawing. On the drawing, we have 77 on the main deck and then 30 on the mezzanine decks. However, this could re reduce in practice. So just kind of the, the main features of the vehicle deck for the option two vessel, um, in particular five car lanes, as, as we said the last time, the increased beam of the vessel allows a bit more space between the cars, as I'm sure we're all aware. A lot of the existing vessels, uh, it can be a bit of a trouble getting out your cars sometimes. Um, in turn, that would have the four commercial lanes, as you can see on the diagram. Four uh, hoistable mezzanine car decks, we're looking at one double and one single. Um, and this provides a bit more flexibility because down this kind of centre, uh, in between the two mezzanine decks, you can actually have HGVs stored there, whereas if we were to have two doubles, then we would take away that flexibility. Um, we would also have an open zone for the carriage of dangerous goods, um, as, as we do in all our kind of new modern vessels. And uh, a thing that was kind of raised quite a lot the last time was about electric vehicle charging points on the, the vessel. It is an intention to fit these. Uh, the exact number of we will, we will look at uh, more during the detailed design, but we do intend to fit these on the vessel. Um, next slide, Jim. Oh, sorry, I think you've skipped one. All right, there we go. So, uh, so still sticking with the car decks, we had a few queries around um, the hoistable mezzanine decks and the, the, the height underneath the stowed deck and then the deck in operation. So when, when the deck is stowed, as you can see in the left-hand diagram, um, we'll have 5.1 metres, um, which allows um, full HGV. I mean, I think the highest HGV we'd likely get is around about 4.95 metres. Um, obviously, it's a very rare occurrence, but it is good to have this flexibility. If we compare to Finlagen, uh, we're limited to the 4.6 metres, which means most of the HDVs are stored on the other side of the vessel, and it just doesn't allow the same flexibility. So we have this requirement of the 5.1 metres. When the, uh, the MESDEC is in operation, as you can see on the right-hand side diagram, uh, we have 2.9 metres underneath the, the mezzanine deck, and then 2.1 metres above. Um, this would be the same on both sides, it's just showing this for the double one. Um, what this would allow is kind of higher sided vehicles to go underneath the mezzanine deck, um, such as maybe certain types of camper vans. Again, very much uh, vehicle dependent, but it gives you a, a bit more flexibility for loading operations. 
Um, moving on, Jim. Touching on um, the vessel and port interfaces, again, some queries that we've kind of had around about terminal fits. Uh, will the, the larger beam, the, the increased length, etc., be able to fit the terminal? So we have done a number of terminal fit studies, um, checking vessel port interfaces, um, and basically just making sure that we fit all the primary and secondary ports around uh, the Isla Endura network. So as you can see there in the table, we'll have the Kenna Craig link span and the Kenna Craig fixed ramp. So both of these, the, the requirement is to go bow in, but also to be capable of sterning. You may be aware that the Finlagen right now operates on the fixed ramp sterning due to the kind of relationship between the bow ramp and the fixed ramp. But we seem to have a solution for that that will allow the new vessel to go bow in on the fixed ramp, but still capable of being sterning as well. At Port Ellen, we, we of course have the link span and the fixed ramp where we're both staring in. Port Askeg, staring in, Collins is staring in, and then at Oban, normally bow in, but also sometimes maybe, if required, to be capable of being staring in. Um, so these terminal fit checks, we've also, we've also taken into account any known um, changes that would be a result of the port enabling works, and this will also be carried out again during the detailed design of the vessel and the detailed design of the ports. Um, the bow ramp, we don't have any issues with the bow ramp lining up with any of the link spans or the fixed ramp, so we don't need any uh, solutions to the ramp to, to get it to fit. Um, one kind of benefit we do have of increasing the beam, and um, we have this uh, a wider bow ramp, which would provide a clear driving width for four metres, comparing this to 3.5 metres on the Finlagen, and this just allows a better flow of uh, kind of wide loads on and off stair ramp. You may be aware of seeing the Finlagen sometimes having to go in and stern in to allow wide loads off. Next slide, Jim. Staying with the vessel and port interfaces, um, so no solutions required for the bow ramp, but with the increased beam and due to the nature of the, the link spans and the fixed ramps that we're having to operate at, we will require a, a solution for the stern ramp for the vessel. So, um, Basically, we've, this is a very high high level diagrams that you can see in your bottom bottom left here. But basically, the outer se uh, section of the stern ramp will move from side to side along the kind of main piece. So you can see there the different positions. So we have the centre line position, port asking position, port airing, port airing fixed ramp. So again, the plan is that this will all be controlled hydraulically, electrohydraulically, purely down to the fact that it will be occurring every second journey where the ramp will have to move. The intention is that the outer section can be moved while the vessel is in, uh, while the ramp is in the vertical position. And it means the crew can get it into position before the ramp has to be in operation. Um, Jim, I don't know if you'll be able to play uh, the animation on the. If you hover over it, there should be a wee play button. So as you can see there, the ramp is moving from side to side. So this is a similar solution that we have. Uh, we're, we're intending to do a Glen Sanox, so that the ramp has been designed for a Glen Sanox, we've just not had a chance to see it in operation. So as you've seen there, the, the outer section slid from side to side. Not the exact same for this the vessel, but a kind of similar idea, um, which we can hopefully provide more details as we progress into the detailed design of the ramps. Uh, next slide, please, Jim. Last time we, we touched on crew levels very briefly. Um, so since we're kind of going ahead with the option two, Calmac, Calmac have assessed the crew levels for this preferred option, and this takes into consideration quite a few uh, items that we touched on the last time. So, number one, mainly the vessel design. Then we have to think about the safety requirements, the safe manning, which is the minimum crew we need uh, to safely run the vessel. Then taking into account the muster list and how we can evacuate the ship, and then of course the service specifications. So, the timetable that the ship is running on, and then the retail offering that's been provided also impacts the crew levels. And then, of course, the hours of rest regulation uh, taken into account. So based on all this, um, the proposed crew for the vessel is 27, which is two less than the MV Finlagen. And what we, we did touch on uh, is that the, the vessel will have 31 cabins, and this is down to having sport, uh, four spare cabins for crew familiarisation and for cadets training. Next slide, please, Jim. Um, moving on to retail offering, so we touched we touched briefly on retail offering last time when we presented the kind of option that we'd like to go ahead with. So um, based on that, uh, we had noted that it would be one larger retail outlet rather than multiple outlets. 
Um, following this, we did receive a, quite a bit of feedback in the Q&A document, um, roughly about eight, and it was quite mixed responses. Some people for for this, some people against it. But based on the feedback, the um, majority were in favour for, for to proceed with one retail offering in the form of a mariner's cafeteria, but with a kind of extended service still providing kind of some uh, sale of retail goods, etc. Um, the mariner's cafeteria so will offer passengers a full range of hot and cold drinks, hot food, pre-packaged sandwiches, wraps and salads, newspapers, and then, as I said, the limited range of, of retail goods. Um, this outlet will have reduced operating hours with no service being offered on the first sailing of the day. And um, we will also provide a vending offering, and this will allow hot drinks to be available to customers at all times uh, during all sailings. Moving on, Jim. So we touched uh, briefly on the kind of passenger spaces and the facilities, just to go into them in a wee bit more detail, just to give you an idea of kind of where the space goes for the passenger area. So um, as we do in the majority of our vessels, uh, an entrance area for the passengers where we have our main passenger entrance doors, uh, our luggage racks, and then what we're kind of normally starting to show is some entrance seating area, which has come in really handy um, for people waiting to embark and disembark the vessel. Um, for Toilets is one that a lot of us maybe forget about, that, but it does take up a considerable amount of space. We have to provide a certain number of male and female toilets to meet the regulations. Um, as the passenger accommodation will be likely split over two decks, we will provide an accessible toilet uh, and also a changing place facility, which we'll touch on in a wee second uh, in a bit more detail. Also providing a kind of separate baby changing area, um, which has its own toilet facility that anybody can um, gain access to a children's play area so for a range of ages and it's got to be located close to the family lounge and um, the various seating areas and, and various lounges so family lounge pet lounge and um, recliner lounge and then a social lounge and quite a few requests are asking about but would the vessel have a quiet lounge yes it is an intention for there to be a quiet lounge on the vessel which is a separated quiet area away from away from everywhere else and then, of course, as I touched on, the retail outlet in the form of a mariner's cafeteria. And then just to kind of show you how the, those spaces, just very high level, how they would be laid out. So you, as you can see, um, again, it's it's quite far out, but please later take your time to, to zoom in when you get a chance to see the uh, presentation on YouTube, download it uh, in PDF form. So it just shows you very high level. Um, the different areas that I've just mentioned there, so the entrance area, the family lounges, the quiet lounge, uh, the retail outlet, obviously taking into account the galley um, and the crew accommodation as well. Um, a question that we had received the last time was about space. With this being a, a larger vessel, would there be more space for passengers? Um, we kind of gave a rough breakdown. Now, obviously, for option two vessel, this may be subject to change during detailed design. But if you look at the kind of split of passenger areas to crew areas, it is um, we'll actually get more passenger space, albeit just two percent more, but um, it's it's almost in the same kind of ratio for as the Finlagen. Um, although we have a longer vessel, there is a uh, not less air, uh, slightly less superstructure just to reduce the windage of the vessel. And then moving on to some accessibility features. So touched on this the last time. Um, Basically, all the, all the items here, most of them we are covering during uh, the, the design of the Glen Sanox and Able 2, so you will see these uh, on these two vessels. We have really engaged well with communities in previous um, with accessibility panels, mainly uh, the North Ayrshire access panel for the Glen Sanox and then the, the Harris access panel for uh, Able 2. So we're trying to improve on this for, for every vessel, um, every new vessel. We have been in touch with some stakeholders from Isla as well although there's not a kind of dedicated access panel. But if anyone has any feedback, we'd love to hear um, any ideas that we've maybe missed on the screen. So just to go through some of these, such as uh, lift access. So we're looking to put two passenger lifts on the uh, vessel, which will provide access from the vehicle decks um, to all passenger areas, including external areas as well. Um, lift size and features. So as I've touched on before, the existing vessels um, they're kind of limited due to the mainly due to the side casings on the vessel, but with the increased beam in this, this vessel, it allows us to have larger uh, lifts and it allows the 1.5 metre turning circle um, to meet the kind of regulations for inside the lifts. Also, all the fittings and fixtures within the lifts will comply with, with latest regulations. 
Um, sounding loop system, um, so that's again something we're looking to do in 801 and 802, which will continue with this vessel, providing the sounding loop system in uh, the lifts as well as accessible toilets. I touched on it the last time, the increased beam um, allows uh, increased width for passage, passenger walkways, looking at a minimum of, kind of 1.5 metres for main passenger walkways. And also for staircases, it allows increased width for passenger staircases, and in some cases allows for spiral staircases. Uh, which saves space for other areas on the uh, vessel. Uh, handrails, something we look to include is handrails to be fitted at two heights and particularly on staircases. Um, changing place facilities, so I've touched on it previously. Changing place is, is almost like an enhanced accessible toilet with um, the, the folding bench and a high adjustable bench, the hoist and sling. Um, it has a minimum size of 12 square metres and it, and it adheres to a, a changing place guidance, which you can find on the internet. It's very, very useful information. And then also a more kind of standard accessible toilet, um, which we provide on, a, on the other deck from the changing place. As I touched briefly on the last time, dedicated wheelchair spaces throughout the passenger lounges, uh, height adjustable tables, looking to fit these in the cafeteria, but, but also throughout other areas of the vessel, um, double height counters in way of uh, reception counters and serving counters. And one a, a kind of small detail, but staircase nosing. So the actual nosing of the staircases being a different colour from the the, fl the floor covering um, for visually impaired passengers. And that just gives you a kind of idea of the overview. I'm now going to pass you on to Kevin, uh, who's going to touch on uh, passenger capacity. Yeah, thanks, Lewis. Um, yeah, passenger capacity. One of the um, major questions that we received last time was looking at passenger capacity. Obviously, the Finlagen has a, a 550 passenger capacity and we're proposing here a 351. Um, colleagues at TS Analytics team um, looked at the uh, details of data that was provided by CalMac in relation to what sort of numbers we were we were looking at and where the peaks and troughs occur. Um, fairly obviously, uh, when you look at this, you can see that the busy times tend to be in the May, June, July and August period. Um, and you will see that the, uh, the, the, the red colours are, or the deep red colours, are the few times that uh, the, the um, vessel on a single sailing um, would experience more than 300 people. So if we go to the next slide, please. So again, probably difficult to see on your computer, but you can you can download this later and have a look. Um, in in a very very simple sense, if you look to the to the right, um, it, 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 two analyses there. Um, we have two vessels with 550 capacity each. We have two vessels with 350 capacity um, to the to to the right. Um, Basically, if you if you look at the far right one uh, on the 209, uh, 2019 metrics, you can see that there are five times um, that it's exceeded the 300 mark. So, if we go to the next the next slide, we can look in more detail at what that actually looks like. Um, we we've looked at the days that that happened when it exceeded the 300. And this gives you a very, very granular picture of exactly what is happening on those sailings. And you can see there, looking at the different colours, that we have got some sailings, but very few, um, which are sort of in the 80s in terms of uh, in, in in terms of capacity. Um, but if you look across the days that, that actually occurs, the actual passenger numbers across a day's worth of sailings ranges between 52 and 56 percent, so just over half um, on, on, on the basis of a, of a 350 vessel. So, so broadly, um, it is fair to say that in future years we might start on single sailings getting to passenger capacities, um, but if you look at it on, on, on a daily basis, whilst you might not be, get, be able to get on the specific sailing that you require, certainly during the day, um, there is ample capacity uh, across a day. So um, as it stands, we can't see people being turned away on a day, although it is possible that you might be um, at capacity uh, at some future date beyond 2030 um, with, with regard to 
specific sailings during a day, but you can see there 2020 isn't representative. Obviously, 2019 is is the highest that we can see, and that that gives you the granularity on the pinch point. So, just to let everybody know, that's that's just over half full um, across those five days when when those numbers occur. So, okay, that's me. So, um, port infrastructure. Um, just going to sort of talk you through what type of port infrastructure changes we're going to have. At Kenner Craig, there's going to need to be some dredging and, and associated work. So that's because we've got a deeper drafted vessel. And of course, the deeper drafted vessel and the beamier vessel gives all the fuel sailings across the across the, the whole um, life of the vessel. Um, and obviously, it's not only about cost these days, but it's about carbon footprint. It's about emissions as well, which are very important. And of course, being part of a, um, a government owned organisation, we are looking very, very closely that, that trying to marry in with the net zero ambition by 2045, which is Scottish government commitment. Um, we would need to replace the fenders and we need to do some strengthening works so for those that know Kenner Craig well. Uh, when the Finlagen came along, there was the the, the new installation, which was basically the, the turning dolphin at the front um, and uh, the pier behind is the original pier. Um, so that's going to need some strengthening works to be done um, to, to make it strong enough for the for, for the slightly larger vessel. Uh, Port Askeg is is pretty deep um, and, and it's it's well formed, so we don't see any dredging or associated works. But um, as was indicated by Jim, um, we've been doing some analysis for three months with regard to the tidal flows, um, the wave action, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, which will be pulling that particular device out of the water in, in early April and downloading all of its data. Um, but we believe that there will be an absolute requirement to have something called a semi-automatic mooring aid, um, which is a system called MoreX. Um, and we're, we're looking at that at the moment. Um, that would need to be specially installed at the quay side. Um, so the MoreX itself doesn't cost 1.6 million, um, but there's associated piling work so that the the deck is strong enough to to actually take the forces, which it will be a, a hundred ton load force, which we can we can use there. Port Ellen, um, again, dredging and associated works um, and also fender replacement works will be required there. There was work done there back in 2010, 2011. Um, at that time also, there was a harbour revision order to increase the marshalling area, which will come on to later um, as, as, as part of this discussion. Um, but broadly, if you look at the, uh, the pier, we've got the dredging and associated works and the fender replacement works first and foremost to accommodate the vessel. And Colin say again, enabling works there, um, some relatively minor dredging of some high points, um, some fender replacement works and also some protection for the um, uh, pile toes. Um, basically the piles hit bedrock relatively um, quickly in, in that area. So we're going to have to protect those from scour. Um, so you can see the overall enabling works is estimated at 16.4 million, um, but there is optimis uh, um, optimism bias in there, um, which ranges from places that we know fairly well at about 30% and places we don't know quite so well where there's more concern, not concern, but more, more um, uh, work required. Uh, that's seeing it 44%. So the 16.4 million is a, a approximately boosted by 35% um, uh, to, to accommodate that. Next slide, please. So shore power, and um, we highlighted in January that we want to upgrade all of these facilities for shore power, Kenner Craig, Port Ellen and Port Askeg, and that's regardless of whatever we choose. So all vessels that will be built now will have the ability to power, uh, to plug in to shore power overnight for the hotel load. The ships will, when they lay up overnight at the moment, they run on diesel generators, which obviously cause localized pollution, carbon footprint, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you can, um, if you can use shore power, then you eliminate that, um, and we can also use that for storing, uh, charging the the batteries on board, which Jim mentioned uh, previously. Um, the emission reduction is estimated at about 10%. So 
um, any vessel that's tied up basically overnight for 10 hours um, by actually plugging it in, you'll save about 10% of the, the fuel that the ship burns. And there will be an associated reduction in uh, of about 6% compared to the Finlagen by using shore power overnight. So the basically that means that we don't need to use generators at all. Um, and the added advantage of that is the overnight noise um, on, on a calm night. You can hear the generators going. It will be basically silent. Um, so the, the shore power at the three ports um, is estimated 2.6 million pounds which includes this 44% optimization bias. Um, in terms of service disruption, enabling works will cause service disru disruption. Um, we're looking very, very carefully with our consultants and, um, and, and engaging with contractors at the moment because fairly obviously the, the, the aim is to achieve what we need to achieve with a minimum disruption. I can't really give you any firm details on that at the moment. It's still a work in progress. Um, but um, when the construction methodologies are actually finalised, we will absolutely ensure that we will minimise the amount of disruption and we will engage with the communities when we know that to let them know exactly what that looks like at each location. Um, and, and just we will absolutely make that um, service disruption as minimal as it possibly can be in the circumstances. So next slide, please. Uh, marshalling area Port Askeg. Obviously, the Finlagen at the moment has um, 77 PCU, the Hebride 68 PCUs. There's a Port Askeg has um, space for 91 PCUs, so it will be um, slightly undersized, um, certainly compared to Port Ellen um, for the 100 PCU vessel. Um, this is a, a facility that isn't owned by Seamount, it's owned by Argyle and Butte, but we have something called the AFIG meeting, which is the Argyle Ferry in Infrastructure Group meeting. And Argyle and Butte are very, very aware um, of the ships that are coming potentially and um, will, will are looking at all the options to do something about the marshalling capacity. Um, so that will be taken forward as a standalone project by them, um, but it's, it's re required in any event. So. Next slide, please. Port Ellen, uh, there's some fairly long standing issues around marshalling at Port Ellen. Um, the, there has been a gradual reduction in the number of PCUs due to health and safety concerns, and it is fair to say that the marshalling area is undersized of the existing vessels. Um, we are looking at traffic management at the moment, um, and it looks as though there's going to be a restriction um, from the winter timetable of 21 22, um, and that will not allow the realization of the full benefits of a, a larger vessel until improvements are made. Um, the marshalling capacity at Port Ellen needs to increase, and it was always in the long term asset plan. Um, some of you have been around for quite a long time, longer than I have, would have realized that. There was uh, the prospect um, quite a number of years ago with a, a, a harbour revision order um, to actually carry out that work, but the money at the time wasn't available and just the actual uh, peer works were done at the time. Um, we're looking at the moment at options and we're looking at them urgently because fairly obviously this needs to be dealt with as quickly as possible. Nobody wants to see a new vessel come in and, and it cannot be used to the full extent that we would want it to be used. Um, broadly, um, unless we can accelerate this, um, we're looking at about a cost of 20 million pounds and it will take five years um, to develop this. Um, this includes an 18 month construction period at the back end. Quite a lot of this type of work um, is to do with the detailed design, to do with marine consenting, to do with harbour revision orders, potential for environmental impact assessments, and all those things are things that have been brought in in the past few years, which which are now necessary and a legal requirement, but it does delay us actually getting shovels in the ground. So um, in, a, in, in a broad sense, we are absolutely aware that we need to, to do something about this, and we are um, absolutely turning our attention to it um, now and I have been for the past six, eight months. So next slide, please. So you can see broadly the advantages and disadvantages. So safer, more efficient marshalling areas and overall ports allow all vessels to run um, to the design 
uh, capacity works will be uh, intrusive, disruptive, especially at Port Ellen, given the work that needs to go on to increase the marshalling area as well as doing the work that I described with regard to the fendering and the dredging. Um, and it is likely um, that the new vessel will not be able to run at full capacity for up to two years when it's uh, when it's first um, introduced. Next slide, please. So you can read the conclusions yourself, but um, basically there will be the enabling works and the risks have been uh, identified and allowances made, which I've described. Um, once the works are complete, Kenna Craig, Port Ellen, Port Askey and Colin say will be able to accommodate the vessel, the new option two vessel. There always remains a risk with any construction of unforeseen conditions. However, um, we know most of these ports pretty well. Um, we've done work in, in there in the recent past and we still have employees that have done work there and consultants. So we, we, we believe we've done as much as we possibly can. The long term strategy of CMAO in any event has always been to increase the depth and up, upgrade the piers um, across the whole network. To be honest with you, you would be aware that many of these ports were effectively uh, developed for paddle steamers and they haven't moved on much since. So um, that that is just a, a fact that we have to live with and we are sequentially going through the ports and making them um, more more compliant for, for 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 larger and deeper drafted vessels so we're aware of the port ellen uh, phase two issue and the uh, desperate need for the increase in marshalling area and a new terminal building and this is being progressed as quickly as we can as a standalone project um, and would need to be done regardless of the introduction of a new vessel because it isn't really big enough any longer for the existing vessels leave alone the new one so the costs don't include a brand new pier at Kenna Craig. That work was originally um, planned for about 10 years ago. Um, we weren't able to do it again through lack of money, um, but that will have to be done um, in, in the medium term. So within the next range of five to 10 years, um, and we're getting on it uh, uh, with that as well, but not at the detriment of the Port LM phase two project. Next slide. And that is me for the time being until the Q&A. It's over to you, Mark. Thanks, uh, Kevin. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for that. Again, um, apologies. I know it's been a bit of a long presentation, so I'll not take you too long with this one. So just to provide an update from the previous webinar we had on the on the free additional freight services and we just wanted to touch or again just a sort of a short summary of where we are with that. So just just to try and reinforce that a lot of consideration and a lot of analysis has been done to try and make sure the accuracy of our forecast to provide the assurance that potential demand constraints are being met. And um, as you can see, the forecasted demand figures which we've based on is from the 2016 to 2019 actual carrying figures. Um, this was again supplemented by economic growth assessments by a third party assessor. We've also, as I previously stated before, that we've also looked at the CISTRA report, which was conducted or commissioned rather by Argyll and Duke Council, Highland and Island and Enterprise and the Scottish Whiskey Association. And what we'll find with the CISTRA is that the demand projections for the distilleries are included in that. Now, the graphic you can see on your right, as we can see, it's just to try and show that the VRBP forecasts that we're actually using are tracking extremely close to the actuals. So this, again, provides ourselves and hopefully um, everyone else the greater confidence in the reliability of the VRBP forecasts that they're very, very, very similar in the way of tracking. So it gives us a sort of sense of security that we're on the right track here. Again, the Sistra, was very similar as well. Again, it's something that I did see in January that we are going to obviously monitor it. Um, in summary, what it's really meaning is it's the same as I stated in January that we don't envisage that additional freight is required in 28-29 at least. So really in a sense, we have got time to monitor, uh, to monitor the situation. Um, I think as we've covered in some of the previous slides that there is plenty of capacity there for people. Um, and again, it's just a case of us having to monitor as we go forward. So not too much on that. And again, happy to take any questions at the end of that. 
So, Jim, just for that slide, I think it's back to yourself for planning dates. Oh, Jim, Jim, you're on mute. Here I am. Sorry. <laughs> so it's an update on the on the planning dates. Uh, so we've got the feedback uh, from the the March public engagement. That's we'll, we'll take the feedback. Uh, we'll look at all the questions we're going to get tonight. All the questions that will come in to the the CMAL, uh, mail inbox. <coughs> we will then update the Q and A, and we'll update that and put it on our website. Next stages. Following that and completion of the Q&A uh, is then to go towards the vessel procurement <coughs> and the planning date for that for the first stage of that is actually in Q2 2021. So that's that's our planning date. So that's the next big stage which I'm going to come on and talk about in the next slide to actually go towards the first stage of procurement. Then Following that, we will be looking at getting the business case approved and then that will lead us into the actual invitation to tender stage, all being well in Q3 2021. And looking at potential dates of contract award for a shipyard in Q1 or Q2 in 2022, which is obviously 12, 12 months from now. There's, there's a lot of work to do before we get to that stage. The procurement pro process is a lengthy process with the various stages and the and the evaluation that we have to go through. So this is this is the latest planning dates that we have, and that would take us to looking at a vessel delivery in Q2 or Q3 2024. So that's our, our latest planning dates that we have. So that takes us on to the next stage following this webinar and following the you know the update on the, on the Q&A is that we anticipate moving to stage one of the procurement for the new vessel. We call that the call for competition in Q2 2021 and obviously Q2 starts next month in, in April. Uh, the, the first stage, tender stage one, is what we call a selection questionnaire and the reference document here is called the Single Procurement Document Scotland. And uh, once this is uploaded onto our website, you can click on that link and that just gives you a bit of background to, to what's involved in that. Uh, the SPD Scotland is a standard questionnaire that allows buyers, and in the case of CMAL, we will be the buyer for the vessel. That'll allow us to identify suitably qualified and experienced bidders. So this is first stage before we even think about issuing a technical specification and inviting you know, an invitation to tender. Uh, it will contain questions on both exclusion and selection criteria to, event, to identify suitable bidders that have the required technical and professional capabilities and capacities and the economic and financial standing to design, build, manage and deliver the vessel. And the SPD will also eliminate from procurement those who do not have the required technical capabilities and economic and financial standing to deliver the vessel. So that will be the first stage. Uh, you know, typically for these kind of stages, we can receive perhaps up to 15 to 20 notes of interest at that stage, at, at the stage one. And we will look following that procurement stage one and also following the, the approval of the, the, the business case that we will then move to towards stage two. And that will be a short list of six bidders we would expect that would go forward to stage two and that would be the invitation to tender stage. So that, that's, that's where we're at now. So all being well, that's what we anticipate that by Q2, just coming up in April, we'll be moving towards the, the first stage of the procurement, which will, will be a lengthy process to actually identify suitable suitable bidders who will be allowed to go through to the stage two. So with that, that, that completes the, the presentation. I'm now going to hand over to, to Brian, who is going to moderate the, the Q&A session for us. So handing off to you now, Brian. 
OK, thanks very much, Jim. And thanks very much to all those who have presented tonight, uh, to Kevin, to Mark, to Lewis and yourself, Jim. I thought the, the presentations were were excellent, plenty of detail. Uh, you're not off the hook, though. There's plenty of questions coming in, so I'm just going to take them one at a time. Uh, by way of reminder, if you could put your questions into the Q&A box, we'll try and get through as many of them as possible this evening. Any that don't go answered this evening, uh, there will be a Q&A document. You'll find that on www.cmassets.co.uk, Project Isla. Uh, and you can also email us at the Isla Vessel at cmassets.co.uk. So please do that after the event if there's any further questions. Uh, I'm just going to get stuck in. So Kevin, I think you're probably first up. Um, a lot of this has been covered in the presentation, but I don't think there's any harm in revisiting some of it. We have a question which is on Portellan. Uh, and there's a, there's a couple of parts, a short term and a long term part to that. Uh, so at the last webinar, it was mentioned CMAL are progressing a number of small projects to improve the current marshalling area at Portellan. Current capacity is said to be only a maximum of 53, which you've said in the presentation. When are these projects going to be completed and will they enable at least 77 cars to accommodate in line with Finlagen's present capacity? So that's in the short term and in the long term. Uh, well, when will the longer term work be started in order to accommodate the new vessel carrying 100 cars? OK, I've just gone off you, Brian, but anyway, there we go. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the short term we're looking at um, looking at doing some modifications to the actual terminal building itself and uh, around that area. Um, we're also undergoing a study at the moment called a traffic management plan, which um, basically is going to look at all the safety aspects and features. And as as we've already mentioned, the capacity of that um, particular uh, facility has been reduced or is going to be reduced down to 53. And that's a a responsibility of the, the harbour operator CalMAC to determine that, but um, we are looking at traffic management plans and if, if we can um, somehow increase um, that that number up from 53, it would obviously be highly advantageous. Um, and, but broadly, all of this stuff will be delivered in the next 12 months. So, you know, well, well in advance of a, of a vessel even being ordered, leave alone arriving. So that's the, the short term measures. Um, the longer term measures I mentioned already, um, we, we, we did a very, very broad internal master planning exercise looking at all sorts of options of, of what we could do with regard to the marshalling area. That's been carried out in the last 12 months. Um, we, we haven't landed on anything yet. Our intention would be to speak to the um, the Isle of Ferry Committee about some of those options. Um, some of them, to be frank, I wouldn't even share because it's real blue sky thinking, um, you know, double deck car parks and compulsory purchase of houses and stuff, which I don't think anybody would want to go anywhere near. So so we, we will come along and we will share that with the Isle of Ferry Committee to sort of, I suppose, take a temperature on that. But realistically, when we look at other major projects, um, the five years we've mentioned, you know, if we have a really fair wind, we can probably shave that down, um, you know, maybe towards closer towards the four years, but five years it usually takes. As I say, we, we've unfortunately, we had a harbour revision order um, and, and that has lapsed because the work wasn't carried out some 10 years ago, so that has gone. Um, we have to reapply for that. Um, we have to determine whether an environmental impact assessment is required. And our view at the moment is it, it most probably is. Um, we have to then go for marine consenting. Whilst all that is happening, we will basically track alongside that with some really detailed design and drawing up a tender so we can go out to tender as soon as we've got all of the consents and the uh, harbour revision order. And the intention would be to get the shovels in the ground as quickly as we can, to be honest with you. Um, I don't think we're any happier as an organisation about the situation that we find ourselves in, um, you know, all of us on behalf of the island. And we really want to expedite this as quickly as we can. But I, I, I have to be honest with you as a chief executive, when we look at um, projects like Brodick and other major projects that we've undertaken, generally um, this style of work when we're increasing the the marshalling area by potentially 
um, re reclaiming land and stuff like that. It, it, it takes some time these days. Um, sequentially, over the past 20 years, there's been a an increase, shall we say, in, in the amount of regulation around this. Some people call it red tape, other people call it, you know, the right thing to do, but EIAs are relatively new. Um, and if you've got to do a four season EIA, it doesn't take a genius to work out. That's a 12 month delay to a project. So um, we can't apologise about it, but we, we really don't like it. But it, it's, it's just a fact of life, I'm afraid. Um, and if anyone's got any further questions on that, then you can either ask tonight or, or contact us, um, you know, um, further down the tracks. But we, we will be coming out to the, the ferry committee to, to explain where we've got to with all of this. I hope that answers the, the question yeah, to the best yeah, of my ability. Very, comprehen very comprehensive. Um, just keeping on the theme of ports, so it will be back to yourself again, Kevin. Sorry. Um, Kenna Craig, um, is, is there going to be an improvement of passenger facilities? Is that within scope? It can be developed in association with what's happening? Um, it will be in advance of this scope of work. So. Um, our team uh, within the engineering um, and port planning department, um, which is Ramsey, would normally be doing this. And I'm going to make sure I don't sign off his holiday next time in the middle of doing a stakeholder engagement, I must say. But um, yeah, we, we've, we've got plans, which again, we will be bringing forward quite soon in relation to the replacement of the current building. Um, one of the issues that we've had is that the, uh, for those that know Kenneth Craig well, we've got a, quite an old, a fuel tank that needs to be removed and removed properly and make sure there is no pollution and all that good stuff but that will open up all sorts of options and we we intend to replace the the whole of the the passenger facilities there and obviously integrate some of the smaller buildings um which are alongside it which which are used as stores and used for the for the pier hands um etc cetera, etc cetera. so that that work is going to go ahead in in any event during the course of next year, and and that is absolutely not reliant on this project whatsoever. It was it it was called out in our plans for the past number of years, and we will deliver that. That's super. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, let you off the hook for the next one. I think this is probably more for for Jim and for Lewis. Um, we're looking at dedicated space uh, capacity for pets. Have we got any info on on capacity and space for pets? And coupled with that, external passenger space and the exit, do we have any information on capacity and design? Yeah, yeah I can take that, Brian. Uh, yeah, in terms of um, pet lounges, so on the kind of high level uh, layouts are shown, there was a, a space dedicated for pets. The, the space that's there, um, obviously, we'll go through the kind of detailed uh, design of the vessel, and which will include the interiors. But kind of roughly looking at um, space for around about 25 to 30 seats uh, for pet owners in that space. Um, again, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of look at that through, during the design, but that's the kind of thinking behind that. Um, for external seating, so they're looking, there will be uh, on the kind of top deck, so which would be deck seven, there is the main external seating area and there is space for uh, up to 100 plus seats um, as well as space for, for, for walking around as a, as a large area. But we would look to fit probably around about 100 seats. Um, again, what we've kind of touched on before is that we will provide 350 internal seats for this vessel. So the, the 100 external is just a, a nice bonus on top of that. Hope for that answers, Brian. That's super, thank you. Um, we've got a number of questions around um, capacity uh, calculation of passenger vehicle need. Uh, the first one is around how has unmet uh, need, which is bookings not fulfilled, being included in the calculations. Uh, we've also um, a question around, you know, does, does this mean that there's going to be a much higher increased chance of passengers being unable to get preferred sailings? Uh, and coupled with that, uh, how would passenger capacity be affected if social distancing of one metre were again to become necessary in future? So all kind of rolled into one, but if we start with the, the unmet need, has that been taken into account? This one might be for Carl Mack, for Pauline. Yep, thanks Brian, happy to take that. So in terms of unmet demand, there is always a challenge regarding what really is the definition of unmet demand and how do you measure that? 
and we don't have a way, we don't have an agreed definition and right now we don't have a way to measure it. What I can say is the forecasts that were produced by the economic consultants, those do look at a range of different pieces of information, so macro information, local information, from what the, we, we know that the communities want and how we think that they are going to travel in the future. And those are unconstrained. So that assumes that the projections assumes that everybody who wants to travel will be able to travel. The analysis that's been carried out already by TS Analytics, there's a further piece of work that will look at the projections that we've got for, for with the demand forecasts. And we expect with those, the initial results from that analysis is that the, the, the same position will apply, that the, the demand will be accommodated on the majority of sailings. There will be minor occasions, maybe one or two percent of sailings, where there may be demand in excess of the 350 capacity that will be available, but those will be very, very few and far between, and there will still be capacity across the day. So we're just waiting for the, the analysis to conclude from TS Analytics, but we expect the position will remain the same. That's great, thanks Pauline. And does anybody have any, any thoughts on social distancing of one metre? I would suppose that that would read the the capacity but uh, any thoughts I'm happy to take that that again um, although uh, uh, Lewis and, and Jim might want to, to chip in um, there is the, that would need to be taken into account once we've got if there was ever a need um, and it's quite a horrifying need to, to think in the future that we might be back in a similar situation to where we are just now so I think that um, we would look at it at the time and it would depend on the vessel design and it would depend on what the passenger accommodation layout is. That is how we've developed our passenger capacities just now for one metre social distancing and it really does depend on the available space for people to be able to maintain those distances. So it's not something that we, we would assess just now, it's something that would be further down the line. OK, thanks Pauline. Um, the next one is on vehicle capacity. So we've spoken about passenger numbers versus capacity. Uh, but we've also got the same figures for vehicles from experience it's vehicles that are the problem in being able to book part of the future calculation must be unmet need. How's that been factored in from experience? Yep, I'm happy to take that one again, Brian. Thanks, Bob. So, um, yes, we have also looked at the, we've provided analysis to TS on the vehicle demand, um, which is, is shown a very similar picture. And that shows that there will be some sailings that will be full across the day. Um, there's very few, um, almost none actually, when the vessel is first introduced into service. That does increase as uh, demand starts to increase over the years. Some of the constraints are around when it's a single vessel service. So we've identified that that is one of the factors that, that influences what the, the, the factors. What I would say is that there is still sufficient capacity across the day. We've done a heat map um, which we've provided to Transport Scotland that, that looks across each day and there will still be capacity across the day all the way through. Um, there are obviously constraints the further the, the demand increases um, and that's something that will be reviewed uh, continually by, by Transport Scotland. Mark, I'm not sure if there's anything you want to, to come in there around about the, the future. If you want to swing over to me, Brian, yeah, I'll take it, I'll add on to that. Thanks, Pauline. So really, yeah, just to sort of just echo Paul, uh, Pauline's points, we are certainly looking at the heat map. It does take us right up to about 2030, and then we start seeing constraints. But again, like I've said with the freight, it's something that we're actually closely analysing, looking at different options to try and sort of mitigate any problems that we're trying to envisage. Um, it, does, it does give us about a a certain lead time into it where we don't experience capacity. Again, there is, going into grave detail, there is numerous things that we're trying to look at to try and uh, mitigate them, and we'll probably be able to give that more detail um, as time progresses, certainly at later webinars and stuff at the moment. Um, I would like to try and commit to something we can't deliver, but just to give you the reassurance that it's not just a case we get to 2030, then we're all left scratching our heads saying, what do we do here? We are looking how it actually would go further into the future with it and beyond. So that's me. Thanks, Brian. 
OK, thanks for that comment, Mark. Um, Wi-Fi, possibly one for, for Jim or Lewis. Uh, what standard or capacity of Wi-Fi will there be on board? I can, I can take that, Brian. Thanks, Jim. It, what, wi Fi is something we're actually in discussions with the IT specialists at CalMAC at the moment. So we are developing the specification. So quite early days, but we know it's, we know it's an important matter and uh, there's a lot of time being spent at the moment actually developing the specification. So I would suggest when we get to the point of the, the next webinar, we'll be able to give you more of an update on that. But it's something that's being actively looked at at the moment for the for the technical specification. OK, thanks, Jim. And while I've got you, um, what's the minimum safe crewing figure for option two? Well, the numbers that we're looking at as part part of the assessment, you know, considering all the hours of rest and uh, and all the rest of it, we're, we're looking at a number that's uh, 23. That That's the number that's been uh, as part of the, the analysis that's been carried out at the moment is 23. Thanks, Jim. And you'd mentioned vessel delivery dates, Q3, um, 23-24. Is there any contingency built into that at all? What we'll put in, in, in the dates with the Q2 and the, the Q3 is looking at uh, a 27 to 30 month delivery time. And, and that's quite normal for, for experienced shipyards. If we, if we look at the, the Log Seaforth, which obviously be before 801 and 802, which was you know, a much, much larger ship than what we're looking at here, uh, was done pretty much in 26 months from start to finish. Uh, when I worked in the Ferguson shipyard quite a long time ago as well. The Hebrides was designed and built in 24 months as well. And, and it's fairly typical of, you know, these type of ferries. You know, we keep our eye on the market as well. You know, we know there's other companies that are building ferries throughout the world. And, you know, these kind of two year periods are, are fairly typical for, for this size of vessel. So yes, there is there is contingency, but you know, there's there's not contingency for, you know, you know, projects that might overrun for other reasons. OK, thanks, Jim. And I think another one for yourself. Will the SPD and ITT provide an option for two new sister vessels to replace both Finlagan and Hebiles on the Isla route? That is part of the current thinking and part of the current planning, actually, uh, that we will be asking for, for an option price. There's still a lot of work that, that has to be done uh, to look at the, you know, the overall network and, and what, the, what the actual plans would be. But from a point of view of the tendering documentation, yes, that's how the, the tend, tender documentation will be, will be done to actually ask for an option price for a second vessel. OK, thanks, Jim. Uh, quite an interesting one. Um, emerging national and international trends for people to relocate from urban and rural, working remotely internationally. Many people might want to move to Isla. Has that been explored? So I think we're probably talking about an economic growth analysis here. Um, when was the most recent? Does anybody have that information? Yeah, Brian, so the most recent um, was 2016. Um, so there is um, there is possibly an argument that, that those need refreshed, um, taking into account potentially also some of the changes with COVID. And there is a, a very different um, environment that we're all going to be in, um, but we may need to wait for, for things to settle down. So this is something that we would do routinely. Um, we're looking at other forecasting methods and, and other um, statistical methods that are out there so that we can gather this information. So it's not something that's currently being considered actively, but it is something that, that will be fed in to all of the work that CalMAC does, looking at the future demand and how we can then um, plan and, and coordinate our services around about that. OK, thanks, Pauline. Uh, lithium ion batteries. Is upgrading of battery capacity planned in future? Is space for higher capacity to be considered in the design? I'll, I'll take that one, Brian. Thanks, Jim. It's a good question. Whoever, whoever has asked it, and quite a simple answer is, is yes. Uh, the, the, the concept we're looking at the moment is allowing space for twice over, in fact, over twice the capacity that we actually had on the slide. You know, if you recall the slide earlier, we have got just over one megawatt hours of batteries, but we're actually allocating space for at least twice that capacity. So yes, from a 
from a space point of view, we're, we're, we're looking, looking ahead to the future. OK, thanks, Jim. Uh, next one, can Port Ellen Harbour Association be included in the initial consultation alongside the Isle of Ferry Committee? So we'll speak to the Isle of Ferry Committee and I, I don't see any issue with that, but we'll certainly make that happen as part of our wider consultation. Um, so there you go, I've answered a question. Uh, two lane mezzanine decks in use, how much ballast is needed with six, six or well, five or six loaded HGVs boarded? will reduce the dead weight from cargo as now. So how much ballast is needed? Any yeah. idea? Um, okay. Oh, sorry, Jim, on, on you go. Do you, no, take go. Do you take I, I was just, I'll send myself, hang on, so everyone can see me. Um, at the moment, there's there's, there's no known, uh, we, don't, we don't have an uh, accurate figure for that at the moment, but basically the, the dead weight uh, cargo capacity that we've shown is, is taken into account all ballast, um, so the 476 tonnes. Jim, I don't know if you want to say anything on top of that, sorry. No, no, that's right, Lewis, but you've got that. Um, basically, you know, there'll be a, a number of different loading conditions that the, the, that the vessel will be able to fulfil, and, and this will be one of them as well. Uh, similar to other vessels we've got in the fleet as well, Lock Seaforth, uh, the very, very same. So uh, this work's done. What the actual figure is, um, don't have close, close to hand, but yes, that's all been considered as part of the actual design of the vessel. Uh, and again, this will be further detailed when we actually get to the shipyard stage, because that's when you get into the real detail, when you start to look at, you know, centres of gravity of equipment, where the exact locations of equipment that's in the ship. But I certainly, this is all being considered at a, a very, very early stage. OK, thank you. And with regards to shore power, does the process of connecting the cables to the shore side switch gear take place with an automatic system? 2000 amp cables can be heavy and lumbersome, especially if they need to be dragged around twice a day for 30 years. I'll take that as well, Brian. Thanks, Jim. Again, that's that, that's something that we that we are looking at and we are investigating. So as part of the estimated costs that we've got for the introduction of the, the shore tower, We've actually made a, you know, an allocation for um, short power and some, you know, whether it's semi-automatic or automatic, but something that means that, you know, the handling of the cables is 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 a lot more straightforward and and, and easier. And as you see, over 30 years doing it doing it each day. So yes, that's something that's been that's been considered as part of the studies. Thanks. Um, one again on unmet demand. Uh, a couple of suggestions, I think. So uh, maybe just worth. Uh, asking the question, could Calwax start recording unmet demand? I think I think we've we've had the answer, but the suggestions are phone calls, web attempts where no booking ended up being made, or an alternative booking was made. Is that doable? Yep, Brian, I'm happy to to take that one, Lewis, if you want to switch to me. Um, so this is something that we're engaging quite closely with with the the Isla Ferry Committee. The aspiration is the new ticketing system that will be introduced that will provide much richer data that should help us analyse travel patterns and demand much better, that should give us much better insight into the unmet demand and, and how that then shapes the, the capacity that we've got available to us. So it's something that, that we will be looking at in the future. OK, thank you. Um, a quick one, will there be a smoking area? I can start that off and I don't know if maybe someone from CalMAC wants to. So as I'd said um, before, there is a large space on, on the top deck where we'll probably fit around about 100 seats. Um, there is no provision at the moment for a dedicated smoking area, but if this is something that is required, um, there is space for this to be included. I'm not sure if anyone from CalMAC wants to add anything from an operational side of uh, yeah, Lewis, I'm just, I think that's something that, that would be helpful to get some feedback on and we can feed that back into the project as that might be needed. Yeah, OK, thanks. And azimuth th thrusters, I can't see that very well, are ASI thrusters considered mandatory for propulsion or will proposals with other means of propulsion, conventional with propeller, voice, for example, also be considered? I'll take that, Brian. Okay. Yes, another another very good question. Actually, yes, we we will be writing a a requirements based specification 
Uh, and it is a good question because when, when Lewis and I were putting together the slides, we thought very, very carefully about how we would describe the, the azimuth and propulsors or the, or the thrusters. Um, so yes, it will be based upon a requirements based specification. So yes, shipyards in order to fulfill the requirements will be able to propose the, their, um, their preferred option. Thanks, Jim. Um, one for, I would say, Kilmac or TS. Uh, why no service on the first sailing? I'm assuming that means retail. Why not take that? OK, thanks, Mark. So, a good question. Again, I think it's really down to uh, working with Kilmac colleagues, uh, Kilmac colleagues on this, that obviously we're looking at crewing levels and just to sort of reduce the crewing level slightly, I think it was by one again, Pauline may be, uh, be able to elaborate on this, but it just felt for the actual staffing times and stuff like that as well, that looking at the, the, the amount of levels of passenger levels on the sailings, that's why we had to sort of make a, a small reduction somewhere. So we felt the first sailing obviously wouldn't compromise customer service in a sense. So that's why it's the first sailing. OK, thanks, Mark. Um, one on grain for the distilleries. Has the capacity planning taken into account the increased grain requirement for the new distilleries? Slightly different angle. Might be probably as part of the freight discussion. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to take that again, Brian. OK, thanks, Pauline. Um, so at the moment, the the, the um, forecast demand estimates, they don't take into account some of the more recent estimates that have come in from the distilleries. So we are aware that those have been fed into the Sistra forecast that Mark had mentioned um, in his part of the presentation. So we will continue to review both the forecast demand that we have just now alongside the Sistra demand, which has all of these, and we'll look at that on a continual basis to see does that actually shape and shift what the expectations are about the capacity that is available. At the moment, as Mark said, the, the current forecasts that we have are tracking very, very close to actuals. So we do believe that the forecast demand that is currently estimated is accurate, but this is something that we'll be, we'll be given some close attention to just so that we can make sure that any changes that, that might come about in the future through things like the some of the changes in the distilleries, we can make sure that's fed back in and we're adjusting any of the plans that we've got. Thank you. And I think just a follow up on that, um, has the very large renewables potential west of Isla been factored into your calculations? Is this a totally new industry on the west coast? That's completely new industry. I, I can take that. Uh, Brian. Thanks, Jim. Not, not exactly sh sure of the question, but you know, we are, we are in uh, communication with, with various parties about uh, you know, harnessing you know, uh, you know, energy that might be provided in the island. If that, if that's what, what, if that's what we're asking, so that it's not been part of the calculations for the new vessel uh, as such. The you know, the new vessel uh, will, will will operate. You know, and we're plugging into shore power, but where the actual renewable power comes from, that that's something that we we haven't been in detailed discussion. But we are having communications with people. So I don't know if that's a clear enough answer on that, but it's certainly one we could maybe take away and give some further, further thought to. OK, thanks, Jim. Um, now, here's a here's a tricky one. Why not build a new mainland pier at the mouth of the loch? Short journey time and huge savings in fuel, even with better frequency. Who wants to, to have a go at that one? Yeah, I think I'll take that one, Brian. Um, Thanks, Kevin. OK, so it is something that we are looking at, um, albeit at a distance. So we, we have something called the Network Strategy Group meetings, which happen about every six weeks. And we we are in the next one, which is actually on Thursday of this week, going to discuss doing a, a, a stag for Kenna Craig um, and looking at the the potential options of that um, fairly obviously it's not totally straightforward because it involves land that we don't own it involves potentially trunk road extensions and all the rest of it you know we, we've had this discussion on a number of occasions 
with regard to is Uig in the right place and various other ports, including Oban. So it's not that we're unaware of it, but we will we will be looking into it in more detail. Um, there is some arguments to say, yes, you can do it. But of course, that then, you know, how long does it take? Have you got a compulsory purchase land? Is there another suitable location? If, if, if there is, what are the implications for that in terms of building the new port? And one could argue that a port is a port is a port, but when you then start looking at, you know, potential um, extensions to trunk roads, um, objections, public inquiries, it, it does become very, um, very complicated very quickly. So um, we're not blind to it um, and we are going to look at it, but actually delivering um, that, that's, that sort of significant change is, is nowhere near as straightforward as it might seem to the uninitiated. Hopefully that answers that. Yep, thanks Kevin. Um, the renewables, I've had a bit of clarity on that question. It's possibly one one for Pauline, but Pauline, you may already have answered it. Um, it's with regard to traffic demand, you know, as the very large renewables potential West of Isla being factored into your calculations, there's a totally new industry to the West of Scotland with regards to traffic demand. So obviously it'll increase the traffic demand because it's new business, I, I think is the question. Yeah, I'm happy to take that again. So um, what it, there, there would be when the, the original forecasts were completed, there, there, there was a lot of engagement with the local community, including um, some of these industries. So some of that would be fed in. This does need to be a review, a continually reviewed process. It isn't something that is static because things do change um, across all in all environments. So I think it, it goes back to the, the previous point that I made about it's something that we need to continue to review. We'll work with Transport Scotland to decide what is the right point to actually do a refresh of, of the demand forecasts that are there, while we also look at some of the other information that we've got available to us so that we can be clear about what are those changing factors and, and, and how is that influencing and shaping things. So it will be something that will continue to feed in. That's great. Thanks, Pauline. Um, this is possibly one for Kevin. It's on the, the passenger gangway, so it's a ports thing, so I'm, I'm probably looking at yourself, Kevin. Have we looked at the gradient of the passenger gangway, particularly difficult for people with mobility problems? It's it's a work in progress. We're extremely um, aware of the, the situation that we find ourselves in, be it at Port Askeg and, and other places. Um, we, we have to try our, the best of our ability to be compliant with all necessary legislation, but we haven't actually got an answer to to that in a straightforward fashion at the moment. But we we are alert to it, so it's it's something which we're which we're working on, looking at, at some options to to to, um, to to be compliant. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Uh, possibly one for yourself, Jim. Um, it's just clarity on the total cost for this vessel, including the port enabling works. The suggestion in the question is sixty-seven million pounds. I'm not looking for if you don't have it completely off the top of your head. We will obviously get an answer to that, but if you know, mm -hmm. I, I can take that. Thank you. Uh, as, as is uh, in the presentation, you know, an estimated uh, cost of the vessel of fifty million, and yes, just under seventeen million for the for the port enabling work. So yes, that would take you to around sixty-seven million in total. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, and it's the intention to order more. Sorry, is it the intention to order more vessels of the same design for other routes, i.e. Is this the new standard CalMac vessel? I can take that, Brian. OK, thanks, Jim. Uh, this, this, this is the goal. It, it is the goal. The, the, the hull that we're looking at uh, for a ferry design is an optimised hull for them. The, you know, the, the, the resistance values we're looking at for, for the vessel and, and the powering is a, in a real good, good place and it's something we want to build in. So that is something and we've touched on uh, as well on the in the presentation. You know, a lot of these piers, as Kevin says, you know, were built in the, built for the paddle steamer era. So that's something as part of the the, the the sort of whole business we're looking at. That you know, the goal is that this could become the common hull design. We have to factor in that you know there'll be different requirements for different routes with regard to you know, is it freight orientated, vehicle orientated, passenger orientated 
all of these types of things. So you might see that there could be some adjustments in, in the superstructure and how you know the passenger spaces are laid out and so on. But, but by and large, if we can get towards this goal of having this common hull design, common propulsion, common propulsion machinery, uh, then that will take us into a very, very good place. So yes, it is, it is the goal. OK, thanks, Jim. And um, could you tell me what advantages there are in plugging in overnight cold ironing? OK, I can take that if you like. You. Well, we've touched on that in the presentation. 10% uh, of the, the overall daily energy of the vessel, we can actually uh, not use fuel for that not by not running diesel generators and also there'll be the benefit of the existing vessel from lagging where we could realize six percent savings so we know when we take that for the new vessel ten percent saving in energy ten percent saving in you know fuel ten percent saving in fuel costs okay you've still got the the, the short power tariffs for, for plugging in reduce reduced noise um so that so they're, they're the real main benefits so you've you get ten percent before you even even start to think about anything. So that's just some of the benefits that we've got. That's great, thanks, Jim. Um, and one last one in the Port uh, Ellen development. Will the Port development at Port Ellen resemble the previous design produced for the previous Harbour revision order? Pass. I think we'll have to revert on that one. Um, Ramsey, if he was here, could have answered that because he was involved in that. And to be honest with you, I, I haven't revisited what was suggested previously, so I, I genuinely don't know the answer to that. Um, we've certainly got what plans there were, but to be honest with you, I've never ever looked at them. We've tried to look, look at what we would like to do with a fresh set of eyes, so I, I, I can't, in all honesty, say that I know the answer to that. But it's something we'll take away and we can put it on the the the, the Q&A and, and maybe even get some some images of, of, of the, the previous plans up um, just so that people are aware what they were. But I I have to say five years into my time at SEMA, I, I haven't got the answer to that because, you know, all of this work was done 10, 12 years ago. Sorry about that. Uh, no problem, but we'll get an answer to that question uh, after the meeting. Um, all to say is is thanks very much, uh, Pauline, Mark, Jim, Lewis, Kevin, uh, for your your open and frank uh, answers to to all of those questions. If anybody's got any further questions, please use the the email address uh, on the screen, uh, Isle of Vessel at cmassets.co.uk. Um, the question and question and answers will will be published post this meeting, um, all the questions will be answered. Apologies if I've missed any out, um, but I'm just going to hand back to Kevin. I think that probably concludes tonight's proceedings. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, thanks for everybody who's attended tonight. Thank you very much for the, the questions that have come through. I think Brian's done a, a reasonable job at a quick scan of answering the questions that have come in. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for your time. Hopefully it's been a another informative session. Um, there was one thing just to touch on. I think there was a little bit of um, anxiety about the time it took us to, to answer the Q&As last time. But as you can probably imagine with 150 questions and the sub questions and the fact that some of the answers we can't just answer straightforwardly, we've got to consult. Um, with 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 the with the, the operator Calmac and with Transport Scotland, um, you know, with that level of question and that detail of question, it does take a little bit of time. So, you know, please please bear with us. Um, you know, we haven't got an infinite number of people dealing with this project. It's really landed on on Jim and Lewis's desk in the main to 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 run through that. So, we will get the answers to all of these out for the world to see as quickly as we can. Um, on behalf of CMAL, on behalf of CalMac, on behalf of Transport Scotland, uh, thank you very much um, for, for attending tonight and uh, we will be back to give you further updates in due course as things develop, but um, have a good evening. Thank you very much.